Hello and welcome to this episode of The Rest is Entertainment with me, Marina Hyde. And me, Richard Osman. The question I think I get asked most by people who listen to the podcast is, is television dead? And it's a very interesting question because it's, you have to define both television and dead. And probably, there's probably professors out there so you also have to define is, but uh, that's beyond my uh, ken. Um, but there's an amazing bit of research by Evan Shapiro and our, our friends at the Overnights organisation talking about um, viewing habits. And there's, you know, there's an awful lot of chatter in the air about, oh, nobody watches broadcast TV anymore. You know, kids don't watch broadcast TV. Um, but... In very stark figures, they laid out a series of things. And can I just tell you what I think is the the absolute key one? Go on. So overall, about half of all viewing, so that's any content you're ever watching, is still broadcast television. It's 46% now. It's come down from 52%. But roughly half is sort of still people watching BBC One, BBC Two, ITV, Channel Four. That's what we mean by that. Uh, And that, by the way, is a huge amount of people. So it's still an enormous amount of people, which is why culturally these things are still huge and you know country fired is still huge it's why it's why those things happen yeah. but if you look at um 16 to 34 year olds uh, and their proportion of what they watch 14 percent of 16 to 35 year olds 14 percent of all their viewing is broadcast television 14 percent and it's going down and down and down streaming is 39 percent Social viewing, which is largely YouTube and TikTok, 40%. 40% of all television being watched by 16 to 35-year-olds is YouTube or TikTok. And 14% is what we would consider traditional television, BBC One, BBC Two, etc., etc. To all the questions, is television dead? I mean, if you are BBC One, BBC Two, if what we grew up with, and I'm talking about some of the older listeners here, what we grew up with, yes, that is, that is going to die. And it's, and it's going to die fairly soon as well. That thing of turning the TV on and it's BBC One, BBC Two, et cetera, et cetera, that, that is essentially gone. Can I counter that? Yes, of course you can. Okay. People like linear TV, and that is mm-hmm. why all the really advanced streaming services are starting to experiment with yep. it. When they see it, they like it. It used to be that people would watch this type of content on their phone, say yeah. YouTube, the stuff we're talking about, YouTube, yeah, TikTok, yeah. like that. Now they're watching it big screen. Yeah. So you're putting on your smart TV and you're going there. Now, on those things, people find linear very hard to find. Yes. And it, it's deliberate. And they are always trying to make it slightly harder to find for yeah. various commercial reasons. But when people see it, they like it. And that is why everyone from Netflix downwards is experimenting with linear. A hundred percent. And it's the interesting thing that's happened is what capitalism always does. It said, oh, this boring old thing that you've got, we've got a much shinier version of yeah. this. And, you know, 10, 15 years later, you go, oh, what you've actually got is the same thing, but for much more money. Yeah. Uh, and people are very, very accepting of it because it's what they grow up with. And we grow up with a certain thing. Uh, this generation are not growing up with that yeah. certain thing. But you're absolutely right. People still like to watch things at a certain time. But it is a habit of tuning into, you know, EastEnders at eight o'clock or whatever. That has gone. Yeah. And if you're one of the major channels, what does this mean? If you're the BBC, the BBC, the iPlayer, I think sometimes doesn't get the credit it deserves. It yeah. was an incredibly early adopter of streaming. Yeah. It works pretty much flawlessly. You know, we all know, you know, in the same way that Netflix works flawlessly, we all know certain apps that do not work flawlessly and are counterintuitive and just don't work particularly. But the iPlayer always has been. The BBC understood very, very early that the future was not in people sitting down at seven o'clock to watch the same thing. The future was in building up a huge catalogue of things that people could access at any time. And that's the only way they were ever going to make money. Um, ITV and Channel 4 worked it out a little bit later, I I, I suspect. Um and if you think and back that technology to the, was hopeless, no offence. Yeah, and it, but, but it was but hopeless. Both the iPlayer's always been fantastic it's, it's, and ahead of its time. And also, you think of the Ferrari a few years ago, where they said, "Oh no, we're going to shut down BBC Three as a channel, and we're just going to use that money to commission programmes." Uh, and the again, the the, the the commentariat were up in arms. And you think, but yeah, a you don't even watch BBC Three, yeah. and the people who do don't care about this yeah. because they're going to watch it like this anyway. Yes. So the best thing to do instead of having a whole channel with you know a whole building is actually spend that money on programs that people might find and brands that people might find, and the only place they can find them is is on your streaming service, which is uh, the BBC iPlayer. You know, Channel Four is pivoting to digital because can't do anything else. Uh, you know, and they're they're suggesting I think by twenty twenty eight that eighty percent of the viewing of their programs will be on streaming rather than on linear TV. You can you can see it with 
Bake Off and Taskmaster, well over half of the people who are watching those shows are watching them on digital. And, you know, those, those are the biggest shows. And again, building up that uh, catalogue and that archive and pe- people can go to that. But just that figure that 16 to 35 year olds, A, there's a lot of them. B, they're going to be around for a long time. C, they are the people that advertisers want to advertise to. They are not watching terrestrial TV. You talk to the heads of any of the big channels and they'll all say, I mean, we probably sort of commission enough for five days yeah. worth of programmes a week, you know, and in the old days where, they, you know, you'd have, in the summer you'd have lots of repeats, but the rest of the time it'd be originations the whole the, the whole time. And now that's not the case and people complain, they say, oh, these repeats and actually they should take more risks and this, this that and the other. It's, they can't. It's no. like saying to a steam train driver, drive faster. He, he, I can't, I can't drive faster. Yeah. So is television dead? Well, that side of it is definitely dying. We've got maybe five years, maybe 10 years of we still turn on the TV at certain times a day to watch things. Well, the there's certain like, things. Live that, events. And, yeah, and live events, like sport, yeah. um, big shows, you know, Strictly and yeah. Gladiators, people are coming for yeah. that, that moment. But if you're, if you're looking uh, to a channel to be, uh, you know, 18 hours of entertainment all day, every day, then that's not going to happen because it's not it's not commercially viable in any way and that's not the fault of the channels it's not the fault of commissioners it's not the fault of ideas it's it's advertisers the way we live now the bbc did a, an interesting experiment where they got a um radio 1 presenter i put him on a big block that said bbc and talked about bbc and radio 1 and they put it on youtube and then they talked talk to you know they did survey to people who'd watched it and they said oh it was a great youtube show <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And you you become in the YouTube feeding business if you just think, oh well, a little engagement, a little you know, bit of credit is is better than none. That's not the case for our public service broadcasters. And so some people who just say, oh, just put it all on YouTube, it just becomes part of the big YouTube munch, and everyone yeah. just thinks it's YouTube content. But by the way, mm-hmm. if you were a Radio One presenter uh, and you wanted to quit the BBC and put all your stuff on YouTube, that probably is the way to go because that that's the way to make an awful lot more money, and that's the rub of the whole thing. It's very hard for these big organisations to make a lot out of YouTube, but it's very very easy for for content creators to 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 make money out of YouTube, and. Again, the neat trick in the same way that the Netflixes of this world have said the way you do things is outmoded, you know, we will denude you of advertising and uh, we, we will denude you of viewers and now we're going to do the same thing as you. The, the, the smart, thing, it's not smart particularly, but it's very, very interesting, which is television is expensive to make. Yeah. The bit of television I've made for years, which is put funny people in a room or put, you know, clever people in a room asking questions, you know, that's expensive to make and the return on investment is is almost nothing. YouTube stuff is very cheap to make. However, if you start putting YouTube production values on a broadcast television show, people are not interested. They do not want to watch it. They, they can't switch on BBC One and see something that with, with low production values. It's, it's culturally not acceptable to yeah. them. However, what's happening now, as you, you know, as you referred earlier, is people will watch YouTube through their television. Yeah. And if they watch YouTube through their television, they are aware they're watching YouTube and they are very comfortable with the production values of YouTube. So suddenly you've got all of these things which are on television, which look very, very cheap, yeah. which people are very, very comfortable with. The BBC and ITV and Channel 4 cannot do them because we have a certain expectation yeah. of them. But content creators, ideas people can do those things. Uh, and so content there's never been more of opportunities for new voices in the industry there's never been more of because there are routes to market there didn't used to be but the steam trains which Mm. are the bbc linear channels uh itv channel 4 are not able to do that which i think is a is almost unique bind they find themselves in can i talk a tiny bit because i just think it's interesting it's linked slightly podcasts on youtube we were just talking amongst our producers about this, that even the audience for this podcast has mm. gone up 200% in one month yeah. on YouTube. From the, eight by people way, to 16 people. Yeah, for, <laughs> and there are obviously lots of reasons why people, all podcasts I'm talking yeah, about yeah, on yeah. YouTube, people like to watch them because they maybe they like to see the reactions, they like all yeah. sorts of things. They say A lot of people say it makes them focus better yeah. and that it may, they, they kind of they remember it better if they've seen it as well as heard it. There are all sorts of reasons. But it's very interesting that even something which we would, you know, as low production values in many ways as a podcast, which yeah. is honestly just clearly not designed to be a spectacle, <laughs> is, do, you know, no offence to us, is 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 doing extraordinary.
ordinarily and people will watch it and people will watch it on their televisions as, yeah. again on their smart TVs and because they're aware that it's not being made for television that we make no concessions for it being on TV I mean there's a like a thing of us there uh, but you, you it's a little you, bit like the test card in many ways but but if <laughs> I was slightly making, animated if I was making a 50 minute television show mm. then we'd have an enormous studio all day there'd be a staff of about you maybe don't know how shiny that floor would be, it would be incredible. yeah exactly it's just that that's the industry that um I'm used to being in uh, and the podcast industry is very different but once somebody starts using YouTube on their television and watching you on yeah. a screen uh, and they can switch from BBC one to you then you what it is television yeah you know and that's and the they point. don't mind and they don't, they don't mind. suddenly say Oh, now I'm watching an AI voice of someone talking about football's greatest fails. And I literally have just switched over from BBC One. And I don't mind because I un- my brain has readjusted immediately to the switch. That is difficult. Well, the the other fascinating statistics from this this, this stuff from the Overnight's people and, and Evan Shapiro. Um, so overall, in terms of uh, what, in terms of the share of various media yeah. organisations. So overall in Britain, BBC is still top. So yes. it's 24%. So it has the biggest share of, you know, viewing of all content. Uh, then you've got YouTube, then ITV, then Netflix. Okay, those are the those are the big four for everybody. We go to that 16 to, uh, to 35 year olds again. The BBC is 10%. The BBC is beaten by three platforms. Mm. It's beaten by TikTok which has 11%. Yeah. So more 16 to 35-year-olds are watching content on TikTok than they are on the BBC. Oh, yes. I mean... 15% Netflix, 27.5% YouTube. The battle is done. The race yeah. is run for what we remember uh, television to be. As you say, the interesting thing is people still have big televisions on their wall and people are still making stuff, and advertisers are still spending an awful lot of money on content. We can see from the numbers that they're spending an awful lot less money with the broadcasters because they're not reaching the 16, 34 year olds they want, but they are finding ways of, you know, having influences and they're finding ways of making branded content where their money is reaching those audiences, Mm. but it's not on linear television anymore. I mean, BBC is 10%. You then go Amazon, then Disney. That's before you get to ITV. And then you've got Sky, then you've got like Channel 4. and 5. I mean, they're, yeah. it's, it's, they're a very, very long way down that list. And it's very hard to sustain that business model with those numbers of 16 to 35-year-olds. But the stuff is still there. So the, I say the answer to the question, is television dead? Is television is dead, long live television. Yeah. But also, we're heading for consolidation. And it is the only way for certain people to be able to, for certain players in that um, public service broadcast market to be able to survive, I think. What, what would be your uh, five-year prediction in terms of w- when you say consolidation? What oh, you... my goodness. Well, I mean, ha- talking to people at all different channels, nobody likes to talk about five years' time because they yeah. honestly think that people things aren't going to be, maybe even exist in the same way that we, in fact, they think they're not going to exist in the same way that yeah. we see them now. Can you continue with, you know, five five public service broadcast linear channels, I would have thought that something is going to have to give or, or or people are going to have to come together to survive and to make economies of scale and to make, yeah. you know, all sorts of various different things. But it's it's just impossible with the numbers that are coming in to, to, to sustain it. To me, BBC One, BBC Two and Channel Four all being linear channels is something that's not going to be the case in 10 years' time because it doesn't make any sense for anybody. It's, it's all going to change and... I think it's sort of okay. It's, it feels horrible for our generation because we, we just grew up with something. It's like in our DNA, this idea, you know, from children's TV onwards, this, you know, what, what we were handed, what we were given and this linear way of watching TV. But that's not where, where we are anymore. I, I always used to say in, in, in TV when, when they said, uh, you know, TV is dying, you know, does, does it feel like, you, you know, you're, you're the steam train industry? And, and, and I do think in some ways that linear television is the steam training industry but for content creators for producers for people who actually make stuff um we we make seats for trains mm. so i don't care what the train is steam train electric train i just, we'll just keep making seats but for the, but for that shared history that we all have of what television was uh i, I feel like it's going to be unrecognizable but also yes but years. for public service broadcasting which matters and which is a sort of unique really thing in our country that we don't have and which have we talked about things like news polarization all the good benefits it brings to our country people should if necessary club together to fight for that yeah. because netflix 
as I say, as I said it when we went to that RTS thing, which I'm afraid was sponsored by Netflix, <laughs> you don't think they're putting the profits back into our country. They're taking it's it's like the British Empire. They're taking it all and they're out of York, out of India, and they're building Victorian England with it. Yep. They are taking their profits to the States. It's important for people who mind about those things to understand that, as you said, many of these companies are going to then end up copying linear schedules yep. in, in d- different ways. So it's a question of doing what you can to fight for the things that matter that, that those companies don't remotely begin to offer. They don't have news offerings. They don't, ha- they, they don't have public service remits. The things that matter should be fought for, for as long as possible because it's something very, very special about our country and our broadcast model and our news market and all sorts of other things. Uh, and we should hang on to it as for as long as possible because nobody, the tech companies are not going to save you. Big tech is not going to save you. And the the more people remember that, the better. And working to a position where you just feed it because you want to look modern or futurist. I mean, newspapers did this to some extent. Newspapers ended up to be in the the Google feeding business and it worked very, very badly for them because they wanted at some level to feel futuristic. They made a mistake. Hanging on and clubbing together, I think, is the way forward. Yeah, I would say pushing everything through some sort of iPlayer streaming service would be the way forward because it it is extra, an extraordinary piece of work, and it you know it's it's amazing what it does. It's absolutely the best in the business. It exists there. It's run by smart people, and it does have some future proofing baked in. But uh, you know there there are enormous capital costs at all of those broadcasters which are getting zero return on investment because they they're, they're making things that have no shelf life and no particular audience and and, and not bringing in any sort of eyeball that you would need to and not bringing in an audience that, that that you would need to. But there's plenty still there that you could absolutely sort of revise and refine and turn into a, a you know to use a proper British analogy uh, turn it into a Rolls-Royce. <laughs> This is probably owned by the Germans, is it, Rolls-Royce? I can't remember yeah. now. Yeah, so is television dead? Yes, television is dead. Long live television. But um, uh, it, it's uh, look after what, what, what you care about and please understand the pressures that those people are, if you do care about those broadcasters, understand the pressures that they are under. Understand they are not just making a series of rash, stupid decisions. They're working in a very, very difficult economic climate. And it's it's great that some of the broadcasters, at least, are still having absolute massive swings and hits and, you know, making stuff that the traitors is the sort of thing that could extend the life of the BBC by a couple of years. Hits are the thing. Make the stuff that people want to watch. This episode is brought to you by Sky, where you can watch unmissable shows, including the thrilling new Sky original series, The Day of the Jackal, starring Academy Award winner Eddie Redmayne and BAFTA Award winner Lashana Lynch. She is terrific. It's based on Frederick Forsyth's acclaimed novel, The Day of the Jackal. The series is a contemporary reimagining of the classic thriller that sees an unrivaled lone assassin, The Jackal. It's his day. Take on one last job, putting his secret life in extreme jeopardy. He's under relentless global pursuit from secret agent Bianca. The hunter has become the hunted. Oh man, I hate it when that happens. Um, it's one of my absolute favourite books today, The Jackal. It is brilliant and I can't wait to see these two do it as well. Uh, the book itself, and you can see from the trailer as I was taught, it's propulsive. It's got everything you'd want in a great thriller. That's right. Lashana Lynch, who by the way is superb in every single thing she does, plays a British intelligence officer, again, who won't stop until she has taken the jackal down. Eddie Redmayne plays the elusive assassin, the jackal. Can't be that elusive if I know that Eddie Redmayne is playing him. I could work out where Eddie Redmayne is if I had to. It's less of a good movie though, is it? Just you sitting there with your phone trying to work out where Eddie Redmayne is. Oh, yeah. It's done. He's in Soho. <laughs> But uh, it is, uh, it's, uh, it's a real belter, and uh, these two, I think, are going to do it justice. Espionage, subterfuge, violence, they will stop at nothing to achieve their goals. Watch the new Sky original series, The Day of the Jackal, on Sky now. So, Michael Parkinson, this uh, AI story, it's been all over the papers recently. There's a podcast coming out, it's called Virtually Parkinson, where um, uh, an AI version of Michael Parkinson is, is interviewing celebrities. It's been absolute catnip for the newspapers, been absolute catnip for the industry, as in this sounds like the worst thing that's ever happened. It's got everything you don't want, which is um, AI. It's, uh, you know... A beloved national treasure. A beloved national treasure, podcast, that sort of thing. And it's fascinating it came up because around about a month ago, can I play you a message that I received from a, a very old colleague of mine? She's not very old, but I mean... She's been a colleague for, for a long time. Uh, I received this following message uh, and genuinely sit back, sit yourself down, and take a little listen to this. 
Hello, Richard. This is Michael Parkinson. Firstly, I want to extend my gratitude to your friend and former colleague, Hilary, for the kind introduction. I'm a great admirer of your work, not only on television, but also your impressive turn as a best-selling author. It would be an absolute pleasure to have you as a guest on my new podcast called Virtually Parkinson. I know that you're quite used to appearing on a podcast. I've heard, though I have not listened to it yet, that you, you have a quite successful one of your own. Maybe when you're not too busy, you can share some tips with me. Uh, anyway, I'm sure that our, our listeners would love to hear your story on both your career in entertainment and your journey into the world of crime fiction. I look forward to, hopefully, having you join me for a conversation soon. I mean, oh, my, oh, my God. Oh, my God. What do you make of that? Why is my well the first word one always says terrifying? It, it, I mean, this is obviously just in, incredibly lifelike. Yeah, that's extraordinary. I've listened to watch Michael Ch Parkinson for decades. I mean, how, how can that not be him? I, I find that even the little pauses and the self catching in the voice, yep. it, it's so extraordinary. Now, my first instinct, which is I suspect would be everyone's first instinct, is I was un, I was uncomfortable mm. about it, and I immediately said no. I immediately said on behalf of humanity. Uh, I'm, I'm going to turn this one down. Uh, and so I did, and my colleague was very good about it. Uh, and then all this press started coming out about the podcast. Uh, and, you know, a program was sort of launched on it, and everyone seemed very upset. And I, I started thinking, this colleague of mine is very smart. This colleague of mine is no fool. Uh, and when I started reading into it a bit, I thought, I wonder if there's a little bit more to this. So I, I, I got in touch with the people behind it. And the story behind it genuinely, I think is very, very interesting. To the point where I think at the end of this particular um, section, we might have a discussion about whether I should actually go on it. What do you think about that? Well, I, I, I really enough. want to hear it. I have to say, if you t asked me before you played that clip, I would yeah. have had one view and now I've, now, now I've got a totally different one. Yeah. So. It is a collaboration, this podcast, between Mike Parkinson, who's Michael Parkinson's son, who mm. um, owns the uh, the archive, all his father's interviews under Parkinson uh, Productions. He's done all sorts of things for those archive over the years, but that's what he owns. Uh, and a company called Deep Fusion, which is run by a guy, a few people, but but the chap I've been talking to is, is called Ben Field. Uh, and so I, I, Are they purely an AI what are they? Well, they're sort of an, they're, they're more of a production company, funny, and and oh. and fell into AI sort of accidentally. And I said to Ben, "Listen, I'm uncomfortable with it. Can I ask? Can I ask you a load of questions?" And he said, <laughs> "Yeah." He said, "I would genuinely, I want you to ask me questions because I've seen how this has been reported in the press, and I, I'd love to put a slightly different take to it." So Ben's company, Deep Fusion, started. He made a, a documentary about Jerry Anderson, the you know the yeah. puppeteer Thunderbirds, and yeah. Thunderbirds, etc. Uh, and he a had, genius, a genius, exactly. Troubled genius, uh, as, as so many of the geniuses yeah. are. Um, and he had 36 hours of audio archive of Jerry Anderson. And so he and Jerry Anderson's son set about doing a sort of deep fake Jerry Anderson, but using the real audio archive and a different, um, you know, and, and images of Jerry Anderson. Okay. And when it was announced, he said, oh my God, everyone went absolutely crazy. It was called like a meat puppet engineer and all, all sorts of things. But actually when it came out, people I think understood this is an incredibly use, good but way all of... All the things Jerry Anderson would have hated, not puppeteering, not necessarily <laughs> up at the top. It was very, very apt. But actually it was a, an amazing way of using that yeah. audio archive and um, everyone seemed very happy. Recently they did the same thing. Um, I think the same technology was used in the uh, that Backstreet Boys documentary, the Lou Pearlman one, where they, they had lots of his audio but and, and they had a, like a, a an interview with him, but they made his lips say the audio, but were very open about it. Yeah. So anyway, he did that. He did that, and suddenly, you know, he said, "I suddenly I'm now the expert in uh, in deep fake AI and all, all this sort of thing." So lots of people came and talked to me about various things. He said, and I got much more involved in it, and it, to, to the extent that Ben has been across almost all of the big trade bodies in the UK and the US, he's been involved in the, the um, you know, their procedures, how, how we use AI, you know, the legislation that um, they're trying to use. So he said, look, this, this is what I've been doing. I've spent the last couple of years, the US and UK, working out how we use AI in a safe way that, you know, protects people's incomes and jobs and what have you. Uh, and which comes down to four things, essentially. When we're talking about this world of faking a, a human being, using their words, using a, use, using a voice, you know, it's, yeah. that, that's the world that he's talking about. Uh, and he said the, the four things that he has tried to put in every single contract, informed consent from the family or estate or the, yeah. the rights owner by informed consent to really genuinely understanding what it is that's happening and 
the producer also understanding that you know this it's mutually beneficial for everyone so informed consent uh, licensed data so every single thing you're using to train what you're doing has to be owned by someone has to have a rights holder who are not being ripped off so you're not training on anything that you know is Crawling copyrighted over things that don't belong to you exactly that um equal remuneration for the ai version of uh, whoever you're um creating so whatever you would pay a normal human being, you pay the rights holder of, you know, the estate of wh whoever owns all, all of this archive. Uh, and the key one, I think, no passing off. So no pretending yeah. it's real. No pretending that, you know, Tom Cruise is talking to you. So if you do it. So those are the f sort of four key planks that, 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 that are now in place in all sorts of contracts uh, around the industry. So he said, you know, he, he, he did all that. He said, and then um, Mike Parkinson gets in touch. Now, Mike Parkinson, Michael Parkinson's son, is he's been in the industry a long time. He's he is what I would call an operator in the, just yeah. the, the way that so many people I've known over the years are an operator. It's just someone you know who yeah. who has some IP and and you find ways of using it. So Mike Pars Parkinson gets in touch and he said, "Look, we've been doing loads of stuff with this archive. I'd love I'd love to sort of do a you know an archive podcast as well, just to somehow use all this stuff I've got of my dad interviewing some of the most famous people in the world." He said, "And I saw what you've done with Jerry Anderson. I know who you, who you are. Can we talk about? Is there something we can do? Right? So so far, I'm very comfortable with everything that has happened. <laughs> uh, Mike Parkinson and Ben Field meet up. They chat about it." Ben, sort of at the end of the meeting, says to Mike Parkinson, yeah, but what's the point? And Mike Parkinson goes, you're absolutely right, there isn't one. And so Ben said, look, we shook hands and said, that's a really interesting chat, lovely to meet you, we are going to do nothing here, right? Uh, again, I'm still comfortable. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so Ben then says... Someone looks completely different asked me to <laughs> asked me to create, this is a terrifying uh, sentence, asked me to create an AI television commissioner, right, uh, for a, like a like an away day for one of the big broadcasters, just a sort of, you know, a, like always a... Always starts on the away day. Always starts on the... <laughs> exactly. What happens on the away day stays on the away day. So he said he, he creates this thing and uh, to show it off to the channel, he pitches something to it. And he said it was genuinely... He said, look, I'm good in a pitch meeting. He said, I can look at people, I can understand what they're saying, I can make them laugh, I can, you know, I can gossip, uh, and, you know, I can, that's how I sell. He said, I could not do it with this AI commissioner. This AI commissioner, all it would talk about was the idea, and drilled down further and further and further, used all of my what words against me, could not be charmed in any way, no. he said. Uh, and I genuinely felt, oh, I'm having a very different conversation than I would have with a human being, but in quite an interesting way. So this podcast has been, you know, if you read in the, the papers, it's Michael Parkinson interviewing celebrities and, you know, it's sort of some weird kind of hybrid and we know it's not him. And he said, why don't we do a podcast that's split into three parts? The first part is a celebrity comes on and I talk to them and we talk to them about AI and their worries about it. The second part is Michael Parkinson interviews them like a traditional old chat show. And the third part is what on earth just happened? How was that for you? What did you think about it? What was weird about it? What wasn't weird about it? And he said, you know, having Michael Parkinson there is sort of, it's a lovely bow, a lovely rapper yeah. to make a podcast that you wouldn't otherwise listen to. Uh, and I, I absolutely buy that. As well, a this is really podcast. landmark. Yes. It hasn't been reported. No. <laughs> a, you, Her Majesty's you, you, Press have done an absolutely sterling job of not communicating that. Yeah, we'll bring in Michael Parkinson back from the dead. <laughs> and, and, you know, and... Also, by the way, most people, you hear a story. That's the point. You, you only hear the headline. And by and large, we've got 50 things to think about in a day, so you don't go further. But that's why, that's why I wanted to talk to Ben, because the people who were involved with it, I just thought it doesn't feel they, like they would be doing the thing I'm being told that they are doing. Uh, and talking to Ben and hearing that, you do think, well, that is an interesting podcast, isn't it? Which is, what is it to be a real human being? And what is it to be to talk to somebody who isn't real? What What is that experience? And... I feel like maybe that's valid. Oh, completely. This it's lamb. It would be so interesting. It will, yeah. exp and obviously, t as you say, to have been across all those bodies and to understand those issues in that really deep way, yeah. and then, but to filter it as always through the prism of a real ex human experiencing it for the first time. Well, yeah, I, mean, I think that, it's totally. I think it's totally gripping. Can I ask how you've, it you've changed your tune since two yeah, and a half minutes see, ago? Yeah, I know, yeah, exactly. but you see, that's the thing. Yeah. And so, sorry, how does the actual interview work? Well, it's a live interview. So you're sitting there with headphones. You hear a question from Michael Parkinson, uh, from the voice of Michael Parkinson. Uh, you reply and Michael Parkinson then 
carries on from there. So it's live. It's you know, it's it's as it happens. Um, listen, if I do end up doing, it, I shall report back as to whether there were glitches. But uh, you know, yeah, it, it, it's a light. It's not some cobbled together thing where there's someone giving prompts from a gallery, which, by the way, would happen with a human uh, interviewer. Uh, it's 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 the AI doing all of the work. And you were on your own in a room in the sort of Eames armchair. Yeah. I mean, that would be quite. I worked with a with a with a presenter once. I'm not sure he's ever done a chat show, but <laughs> his writer would be in the gallery. By the way, this is a presenter I absolutely love and a writer I love. The presenter, uh, the writer would be in the gallery, and he would literally just have open talkback, and he would just keep talking, and the presenter would say the thing that the writer was saying <laughs> just all the way through. It was amazing. So, listen, is is that AI? <laughs> If I was Mike Parkinson and I read the newspaper reports in the last week, I'd be like, guys, I mean, I mean, it's, it's my dad and, and I'm a really good TV producer. So maybe, you know, I know what I'm doing. I think that he has spent so long on that archive with his dad while, while his dad was alive and they'd done live shows and all sorts of clip shows and things like that. Uh, and, you know, they were always thinking of new ways to, 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 um, to use that. And, and by the way, if that sounds exploitative at all, pretty much the whole of television now is how do we package up our archive. And also we were talking only very recently about um, legacy and the publishing houses always trying to keep yeah. authors' legacies alive in different ways, not as a sort of trolley dash, but in lots of ways because they believe in the, those writers and, and it's nice to kind of try and find ways of helping them to reach new audiences. This will certainly reach new audiences. Well, I think so. And, you know, what would Michael Barnson not be interested in being a novelty, like a sideshow act, no. like a kind of I am a computer, Michael Parkinson you know, and pretending to talk to Peter Ustinov. Yeah. Right? He would not be interested in that. What I suspect he would be interested in is what on earth is happening with the way we talk to people and what we think about creativity and what we think about conversation. I think he would be interested in that. And Will I, they be able to, do you think, get somebody who's been into someone who is very clever and has been interviewed by him in the past for real to do this oh that's fine I assume so yeah I really hope they do that because to say how is it different or how, or how wasn't it um, and hopefully someone who's one at the slightly more kind of thinker end of yeah, yeah, the, yeah. His, his various guests you know be, not it, emu or whatever <laughs> <laughs> not that I you know I love it yeah, an AI emu and an, an AI, AI <laughs> Michael Parkinson with the uh, that, that's got a show so the, the headline comes out and it, you, it, 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 you do worry about it and anyone who works in in the television industry now is is, is understandably um anything that happens with ai is sort of terrifying yeah. because you know an, an, an industry has been hollowed out but I, for other reasons i suspect which we actually we will get onto when um, we, we, we talk about that uh, chart later um so everyone does worry about it but talking to ben about it the, the i the own i just feel like i'm talking to any producer i've been talking to in the last 30 years uh, and I especially feel like I'm talking to producers I would talk to 20 years ago who said you know we have to do stuff with online and this has to be on YouTube and I'd be going oh god I just want to go to the studio and like you know do like <laughs> normal proper telly uh, and all of those people turned out to be right all of those people were fascinated with technology and wanted to use it in a creative way and wanted to do something unusual and different and my creativity uh, which is, you know, the sort of creativity that, that gets a lot of publicity is the sitting down with a blank piece of paper and writing something down that's funny or thinking of a quiz idea. And that's that's the thing we fetishise. Uh, but actually there's a, you know, the creativity of someone saying the world is really becoming an interesting place. How do I use these new things? And that's what Ben reminds me of absolutely, is, is like a proper smart producer who's thinking, what's the most fun, interesting thing I can do here? Or oh, find a different way to talk about it than the kind of two ways we have at the moment, which is say, this is terrifying and we can't yeah. do anything about it. And other people saying this represents the most amazing, you know, multi-generational opportunity. And to find somewhere in between of all of that, I, I have to say, yes. I think you have to do it, Richard. Yes, you sure. Well, come uh, on, maybe. why not? Why wouldn't you? It'd be interesting, right? Given you can ask oh, anything. Oh, you've got to do it. You know, and also you can't, you can't I guess you can't offend AI Michael Parkinson. You know, if we let's find out. No, I don't know. That's disrespectful. Yeah. Imagine if AI Michael Parkinson walked out and said, <laughs> You know what, Richard, I've heard enough. Uh, that's a that's my Michael Parkinson impression. Amazing. Uh, that was probably the first draft of, uh, of, of the AI <laughs> Michael, my, Michael Parkinson. But, you know, I, I, I do think in amongst the kind of terror at AI, and, you know, the, the, a lot of which is, 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 is absolutely right, this feels like a false flag. This feels like 
a thing where actually someone's doing something rather interesting. Someone's trying to shine a light on what AI is. And Ben, with his track record of what he's done and what he's been involved with, it feels like... I, I certainly think that the road he is going down, he is paving with good intentions. Mm. I think for sure. Where that road leads, who knows? But um, ha- having spoken to him and having really heard the idea, I went, as you have just done, from this is an idea which I'm going to turn down on behalf of all humanity yeah. to, oh, I'd actually be quite interested oh, I'll do it. in doing that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the manpower involved would be absolutely equal to any other podcast, probably more oh, so. Yeah. There's more, more people involved in that. Uh, so more, more people being employed doing it. Um, so I, I, I just well, we thought... we talked about celebs. We talked yeah. about d- dead celebrities and the, the money in them and the, the fascination with them uh, really quite near back at the start of when we started doing this podcast. And I know that um, Mike Parkinson, I saw one quote from him said saying that he, him, him and his father used to do- joke about doing a sort of Jurassic interview show where they would bring, you know, and whatever goes wrong with something with Jurassic in the title, but <laughs> get, get, uh, where they would bring sort of some of his favourite people, like he, Humphrey Bogart, Rita Hayworth oh, so, back so, yeah, so, so, to, Parkinson so that he interview. could interview yeah, yeah. them. Yeah, so I mean, you know, that was just a, a fantasy that they would almost like yeah. use your ideal dinner party. Yeah. Um, but how odd to find that it's got to this stage. I, I honestly think you should do it. It's, yeah, I'm, I'm, I may well. It's, it's Just fascinating as in with, the spirit of inquiry and seeing what it's like. Yes, and 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 also uh, anyone listening, if you have any questions that I could put to the AI, Michael Parkinson, and other people behind it, also that that would be fun. That would be interesting. I can ask you know difficult and interesting questions. But yeah, I, I genuinely, uh, it's 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 interesting because the sense I got talking to everyone involved was, oh, this is just like telly. This is just like interesting people who've got an idea and are making it and spending quite a lot of money and a lot of manpower doing it. At another point, not now, we will talk about how the TV industry is using AI and it's using it um, yeah. increasingly in lots of interesting ways, almost always not in the ways that are making the headlines. Um, but it's interesting the people whose jobs are at risk. But this, to me, does not feel like a threat to anyone's livelihood. And actually, it's the opposite. It's sort of a way for Ben, listen, there's a way for Ben to make money because he's a producer and it's a way for Mike Parkinson to make money because he's a producer. But it's also a way of saying we need to we need to be having this debate about what is real, what is not, what is fake, what well, is not. Well, the way they've structured it, as you said, in those three parts yeah. is it's in the spirit of almost yeah. philosophical inquiry. So it yes. is... In, oh, no, but I mean, that's one of the ways it would be helpful to talk about it. Should I tell them instead of calling it virtually Parkinson, they should call it Michael Parkinson in the spirit of philosophical inquiry? <laughs> well, I think that will probably will be the title they end up going for. It's just a working one at the moment. My episode anyway. Yeah. Oh, maybe, listen, maybe I'll do it. And, and by the way, happy to be proved wrong. I might, I, I might be entirely wrong about this, but my, my, my instinct is that what looked like a bad news story is actually a very, very interesting story made by very, very interesting people. Uh, and yeah, now I, now I really want to listen to it. So perhaps I'll go on it. So you're about to head to uh, the US. Now, I understand how um, UK election coverage um, works, but America have a have a whole other history of uh, election they broadcasts. They have a whole other history of election broadcasts. And this time, of course, they are gearing up for not just election night, but what might be, you know, election week. Yeah. Election week spills over into civil war. I'm yes. mirthlessly joking. Um, so they are preparing. <laughs> it could be the start of a long one because um, obviously elections are intensely close these days as they never used to be. Um, but um, they don't have those sort of same dramas that we, those sort of same very British funny dramas, which, you know, whenever you look at a British election, you, you can go, you're going to go to 650 counts yeah. where there are, you know, people dressed as bins and stuff standing on the stage in a community centre. And I mean, it's all, I, I find it always funny. I absolutely love it, you know, um, yeah. on the, but they don't have that. But it is the biggest ratings for news in America in sort of in the four year cycle, um, unless something absolutely enormous happens. It's like, um, it's like the World Cup for American it politics. Is, it, it is. And it's going to go on a long time. And they need all this because, you know, advertisers, it, that's another thing that people don't realise is that advertisers have really struggled in the last few years with even committing to advertising on news channels because the country's become so much more polarised. You're sponsoring opinion that you may that has become more and more strident and you may not agree with. Anyhow. That's what that, by the way, is why so many news channels are backed by billionaires because actually yeah. very difficult to turn a profit because big blue chip advertisers will not advertise in 
politics these days because it's it's a you know, why it's risk a, it? It's a trap. Yeah. What's your name going to be next yeah. year? Anyhow, um, it's quite interesting um, the the history of it because as a television spectacle, so many things in the American century, the twentieth century. Sort of, we we understand of as television spectacles because that's how they came. In 1948 was the first time they did anything on television at all, and they just they broadcast the returns, but it was very boring. And also they had sort of chalkboards, literally. And what they'd made a mistake. They had the wrong result in their mind. They thought that Thomas Dewey was going to beat Harry Truman. Mm. So they had that wrong. So there was already like, I didn't like the election coverage, <laughs> even though there never had been oh, any. Oh, pollsters. Yeah. Pollsters. Oh dear, they didn't do it very well. That was the first time out. Now, 1952 was Eisenhower versus Adley Stevenson. Now, oh, d- but, d- don't tell me you won because I haven't watched. <laughs> well, by that stage, a third of the households had TV and only 1% had had them in 1948. It grows so quickly, American... Te- you know, by the time you get to 1960, 90% of households have them. The, the explosion of TV is kind of incredible. But um, NBC and CBS both decide, because it's a space race, it's sort of futuristic, it's 1952, to use computer forecasting. Wow. Yeah, and they talk about it for like a long time in advance. Like, we're going to have a computer on election night. It's and got it's- the voice of Michael Parkinson. Yeah. <laughs> Well, actually, they had, and by the way, this is the first election where you see TV ads. And if you go back, go and have a look at them, because I was watching some of them last week. Look for the jingle, I like Ike, which is on uh, uh, sort of TV advertising. You think, my God, was that what TV uh, political TV ads were like? Ike but they being, were. being Eisenhower. I, I, being was Eisenhower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, ooh, computers. Uh, Univac. It's the, C- it's the CBS computer. The Univac? Weighed, yeah, the Univac. That's, it's like, that's like Henry Hoover. I know. <laughs> it weighs eight tonnes. And it's going to tell you who's going to win the election, right? Wow. NBC had the Monroe bot, which was very small, only the size of an office desk. I mean, this would be like, you know, one tiny app on your iPhone now. Now, the Univac, really early on in the evening, calls the election for Eisenhower 438 to 93, right? Yeah. The Univac team think, what on earth? They're, they they are afraid to even tell the CBS reporters. Never mind CBS. Because that's, that's an insane landslide. They think it's an insane landslide, and they think I can't. We can't really tell CBS reporters. Let you know. Let alone the viewers. They eventually do tell CBS reporters who are like, yeah, no, I don't think so. In the end, it's four hundred forty-two to eighty-nine. So <laughs> wow. they missed this great opportunity to say, by the way, computers know quite a lot about this stuff. Okay, but it took till the nineteen seventies for it to become this dominant part of it. But it was always in black and white, so we didn't have this idea of red or blue states or anything like that. And. In 1976 was the first time they did one of those maps, and they had to slot coloured gels into oh, the really? into these cut out plastic spaces. You know, as each state was called. I love all those technologies. On on YouTube, you can see all the oh, it's the, the, the Go old back, UK I, I spent, coverage and US coverage. I've spent the most wonderful few days looking at all of this, and it's it's fascinating to actually be able to see it now and to go back and see it. But that that stage, they thought, oh, red is always a left wing colour, and so red states were Democrat states. It's only in the 90s that this whole idea of red and blue states and people sort of settle on a colour for the party. Is that it's, right? In the yeah, 90s? Yeah. And that's where it all, com- it all comes from television. Wow. It doesn't, yeah. Tele- it, that's that's why we talk about red states or whatever. Anyway, they experiment with various gimmicks and they, 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 they want, because things get called, cool, they all combine together to have one of those companies um, that will one exit polling yeah, group yeah. basically, which which we have in in UK. You know, we we all rely on the same. We exit all rely poll. on the same yeah. exit poll, which is done by the brilliant Professor John Curtis and his team, who is amazing. Um, but they did it for the nineteen nineties nineteen ninety midterms, and after that, they used it. They had this thing, but only until two thousand, where you may remember. They called Florida wrong and oh, that's man. it. It's now polarised. Everyone's fallen apart. No one has, they don't have anything that's the same. They don't all have one all agreed on thing. Yeah. They do ex- They do have ridiculous innovation, like like we do, you know, when every year they, you've got some, Jeremy Vines showing you some even more complicated virtual parliament. In 2008, they had holograms who could come and they were really bad. Wow. Like, so Will I Am would turn up in the studio with a sort of blue ring around him to talk to you about what he thought was going to happen. I once, I, did, I once did a, this is not about American elections, I once did a show for Sky where I recorded it like the year before and you went back in a year's time and you played alongside a hologram of yourself and I've only just remembered that. That's I, great. Was I, I would was like next, to see I that. To, I was next to two Danny Dyers. <laughs> God, but, but the same. I really hope that's on YouTube. And if or, it isn't... Well, there should be four Danny Dyer, shouldn't there, these days. But yeah. The worst innovation that I ever saw, which I loved so much, I had to cover an election all night. when uh, I was pregnant, I remember, and it was two, 2010. 
Um, and the BBC hired a ves- a luxury sort of dinner vessel, the Silver Sturgeon, which they put on the Thames and invited so many people to come to it. Andrew Neil had to anchor it. It was all bar tables. Everyone seemed to get quite wasted. I mean, like I don't want to say everyone was there. You know, Richard and Judy, Joan Collins, Bill Wyman, everyone. Bruce Forsyth. Alistair Campbell. They were all there, by the way. The Passenger Manifest. Do you think Alistair Campbell would have other places to be? Well, I mean, it seemed like this was the sort of node of all orbits. They all came. And whether or not they could actually get off, like a lot of parties on a boat don't Mm. go to one. There's a simple rule about parties on boats. Um, So, and that's UK. And UK does, it's, it's... for a long time, had had slightly more of an air of like you know FA Cup final Saturday. Yeah. Uh, whereas the, the American one is, is is the American networks tend to be a little bit more sober. It's funny because we don't think of the rest of their news coverage as as sober as ours, but we we always taught treated ours really relatively early on as a massive nerd out. Yeah. You know, it is a nerd out. It's really fun, and you can get all these sort of different things. And there's there's a little bit like their journalism at, for, for those periods was more sober. But then they have to have all these kind of widgets and things like that because they have to make it more exciting and make it more like entertainment. But if you look now at what they're planning to do, everyone is settling in for a week. Yeah. So in the old days, you'd think one, it's been really exhausting covering the election. We've got one last push and then, you know, by midnight, we'll probably all know. And obviously they continue broadcasting, but... For breakfast, you were going home. Now it's like, buckle up, because yeah. I mean, remember last time with um, John King, I mean, my middle child, who was very young at the time, got completely obsessed with it and would literally run in from school and put CNN on because it went on, you know, it went on for days, yeah. which is quite weird. You know, you will become obsessed with these things. Um, but it tells you a lot about what's happening now. Like um, News Nation has got a special broad, which is a sort of right leaning news channel they're going to have a special broadcast from Georgetown Law School <laughs> which just tells oh, okay. you, that tells you, you know, there's you every, the, the, the venues that you used to have yeah. are now different and so you've got people who are they're going to people are going I mean disinformation which has become such a loaded word but they get but they think because there's going to be so many days in which it's sort of still unfolding yeah. or being challenged Needless to say, lots of things will spring up on social media. They're going to be. They have already allocated lots of people whose sole job is to say, "No, the reason we don't know here yet is for this reason, yeah. rather than, you know, the election's been stolen. Please yeah, turn up with your guns." Because <laughs> Trump has preloaded so many. Oh, they're stealing it in Virginia. They're stealing yeah. it in Georgia. All these things. And uh, so, if any of those states do go against him, I mean, who knows? Then it's it. Then they're not going to take it lying down. And therefore, it will be a, a job for the. You want it to be a job for the lawyers rather than a job for the mobs. I mean, you don't really want any election to be a job for the lawyers. I've got to say, I I'm know, of the. Uh, I'm of the. I'm of the old view that it should be a job for the voters. But the problem is that they're just so finely balanced now, and there's such a load of mess. Yeah. In the um. Well, in, I mean, in the discourse, if you imagine if 2000 happened now and all coming down to you know lost votes in one county in one state, and it would it, it, it would go on for years if that if that had been if trump had been gore for example can you imagine the world probably wouldn't exist anymore it's an interesting counterfactual that i'll have to consider and in the long night of the election yeah. uh, campaign I, I may consider that out loud but uh yes yeah, so anyway it will be a very interesting um thing but it will go on a long time so you'll have to have your stamina but do please join us for gore hangers Rest is politics. Look, which is going to be have the pre-match build-up, the halftime analysis, wow. and the end of game analysis. If I can just make everything about football, yeah, and our you, football, not theirs. And yeah, and uh, it sounds like the election will go to penalties. Yeah, <laughs> very much so. Yeah. Any recommendations, Richard? Yes, I really enjoyed the second series of BBC Show Trial. Um, it's a completely different story to the first series, but Michael Socher is in it, for, who you might know from This Is England, and his performance is genuinely brilliant but it's about the killing of a, of, of a climate protester and loads and loads of twists and turns like like the first show trial but um you know it, it's 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 a proper kind of uh roller coaster and as so many people do you can watch that on iplayer it's amazing with the dramas you look at you look at the ratings on all the dramas that you get from broadcast and on the streaming services they're, they're doubling trebling quadrupling their audiences ludwig which is coming yeah. back it got up to like nine million because of iPlayer and DI Ray on ITV, yeah. the Hard Acres on Channel 5, they're, they're getting huge amounts of their audience are coming from streaming. So listen, we're halfway there already to this wonderful where, where, where we can still have um, public service streaming. But the show child, I really, really recommend. Listen, have fun in America. 
Thanks so much. I will do. But we will be together for our um, questions and answers episode. We will. I look forward to that under under a under a different president. Under. <laughs> um, so have fun and uh, see you on Thursday. See you on Thursday.